whenever i teach a course for the first time it takes significant amount of time but typically at least in my university and i've known in other universities also they keep you like they kind of want you to teach the same course at least twice or thrice so they don't give you all new courses in a fresh year i think the next big trend is going to prove statistical results for uh neural networks and related machine learning topics that is something i think every statistician is trying to jump on i mean with the recent boom of you know chat gpt and, and then i that- came to know about this institute called india statistical institute which is a premier institute and like probably the best place to study uh, but and the interesting part was that you actually do not need to know any statistics to clear the entrance exam because those kinds of uh create a benchmark where from which you can get a better feeling which direction you would go to personally for me i uh, when during my coursework period when in the beginning of my phd i certainly knew that i do not want to do something that is very computation heavy so my research during at least my phd was pretty theoretical at that time i am pretty much open to work with uh, someone unofficially over maybe zoom meeting or even like maybe meeting if i am visiting or they are visiting hello students you know that in today's world data is extremely important for progress and it affects every part of our life isn't it so it's used in business government scientists to make decisions and gain insights time series analysis is a specialized field in data analysis that deals with data points collected over time this data comes in a sequences you know where each observation is uh, recorded at specific intervals for example if you are studying the sales of a product over several months the sales figures of each month would form a time series in this field you then start to examine that uh, how data changes over time to identify the pattern and trends because it allows you to understand the underlying behavior and dynamics of the data which can be incredibly valuable in various real world scenarios let me give you a few more examples let's say weather forecasting which is another area where time series analysis is widely used by studying historical weather data meteorologist can detect seasonal patterns identify trends in temperature or rainfall and make weather forecasts for the future another practical application is analyzing economic data by analyzing historical economic data economists can gain valuable insights into how different indicators like gdp inflation or even unemployment how they have behaved over time this information can be used to make predictions and inform economic policies and in this context the stock market is yet another big domain where time series analysis is extensively employed by examining historical stock prices and trading volumes financial analysts can detect patterns and trends in market behavior this information can help investors to make informed decisions about buying or selling a stocks now as a student you might wonder that why all this matters and how you can relate this what you are learning well let me tell you one thing that understanding these topics can give you valuable skills and knowledge no matter what you are studying statistics and data analysis are ubiquitous you know it's help you to make valuable informed decisions and contribute meaningfully to your uh, field of expertise so today we have a distinguished guest among us whose focus is primarily on research related to statistics data analysis time series and time varying models on top of that he will also provide valuable insights about how modern trend of machine learning i think you are all aware of this right machine learning and he will provide valuable insights on this that how machine learning can further enhance exploration in the coming years on this field so without any further delay let us begin our today's session thanks shayar for joining us today so uh, we know we have a l- lots of interesting discussions today 
So, starting with, uh, first of all, could you share your journey with us? I mean that uh, how you went from studying BSTAT and MSTAT in a prestigious institute from ISI Kolkata to pursuing a PhD in statistics at the University of Chicago. So, uh, I mean, my question is, are there any particular experiences that uh, shaped your career path? Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Ryan, to, uh, for inviting me. I think it's, uh, uh, it's very humbling to actually be able to speak about my journey and like share my experiences and hopefully it, it can help someone. Uh, so as a student, I like when I was a student at high school, uh, growing up, I always loved mathematics. But at that time, I had no idea about statistics. Now, uh, around uh, my plus two, I came across these exams called Olympiad exams. And based on that, I think I really started loving those types of mathematics. And then I came to know about this institute called Indian Statistical Institute, which is a premier institute and like probably the best place to study statistics in India. Uh, it's a flagship statistics course that was built around 1960 and it's been doing pretty well and it's very well regarded across the world. Uh, but, and the interesting part was that you actually do not need to know any statistics to clear the entrance exam. I think getting into this program kind of uh, changed, if I may put it like that, like it, it probably changed uh, the career path in a certain way. And I do see that as like one of the turning point getting through that entrance exam. Uh, so this BSTAT and MSTAT journey, like after BSTAT, you can uh, directly get enrolled into MSTAT if you maintain a certain percentage or people who could not clear BSTAT, they also have uh, another chance to get into the MSTAT program uh, by clearing another entrance exam at the end of their third year of graduation. So after BSTAT and MSTAT, what is, I think, I mean, there are traditionally two paths that people choose. And the one path is to like sort of um, go towards more academia in terms of like in, in, in the sense that they would probably go on to do a PhD or you can go and like work in an industrial setting. Uh, in an industrial setting, there are very interesting research problems as well. But at that time for me personally, uh, initially when I started to see that like as my research was going on, I was getting consistently okay, like, I mean, at the, at the top of the class. And at that time, I was uh, thinking that maybe I should probably get, I mean, it, it, if it is possible to get a good chance in a great, good university abroad, maybe I can get that degree and uh, sort of then decide on to where I would like to see myself. Uh, at that time, like, so after BSTAT and MSTAT, then I got a chance to study at University of Chicago in the Department of Statistics. So at that uh, juncture, like at that juncture of like five years when I finished my bachelor's and master's, a natural question is like, uh, why did I not apply to directly for the PhD? So typically the statistics department in the US, they look for four years of undergrad as is common in US and like other, like many other universities in India and also as IIT, for example. In ISI though, they were like three years. So that's why people do not apply that much after, right after BSTAT. And once they apply after MSTAT, they actually have probably have more experience and they get admission to very good universities, at least in the US, the network has spread. So I, I, I must say like getting, like applying from ISI helped in a certain way. Also the education in ISI was important in the sense that it, uh, I mean, the only subjects we, we learned there, which is kind of a little bit surprising like in the, if you compare it with US, uh, we only learned like the courses on statistics, mathematics, and computer science, and mostly statistics, then mathematics, then maybe computer science. So it, it gave us a very good, strong technical background uh, to be able to like sort of flourish in the research or like whatever we do afterwards. So then I came to uh, PH, the PhD program after that, joined in 2013 September, and that took like around five years. And when I graduated from 2018, uh, around June or July, after that, I got an offer at University of Florida to join as an assistant professor. Uh, when I joined their assistant professor, then you kind of, then you start building your own sort of research field or kind of an agenda. 
And yeah, that's that's pretty much my journey. Like coming up from 2008, it was three years of BSTAT, two years of MSTAT, then five years of PhD at University of Chicago. And then uh, then I came to join this uh, faculty program, like faculty at University of Florida. Okay, thank you for sharing your wonderful journey. So let us now discuss your research. As I see that your uh, primary research interests lie in exploring various forms of dependence present in the data, so uh, could you elaborate on the significance of this area of study and uh, its impacts on various fields? Right. Uh, thank you, Ayan, for uh, asking this very pertinent question, and I'm glad that actually you took a look at uh, my web page to see what I actually do in research. Um, uh, so it's kind of an interesting topic. It's, of course, as you said, like the last question, uh, how impactful it is in various fields. Now, let me begin with saying that typically, like when we learn mathematical statistics, we learn everything for independent data, meaning like the data sets that we are observing, we assume that they are all independent from each other. And technically speaking, that kind of helps us in deriving certain mathematical formula. Now, uh, what actually happens in real life, which is where the practical application, like scope of application comes, is that in real life, data are hardly independent. They are like always sort of dependent. So meaning if you're collecting data over a period of time, there is time dependence. If you're collecting data over, let's say, different spatial or like different neighboring units, they are always correlated. So one of the uh, main theme of my research area, and I think that has been around like in every research topic that I do, I try to relax this independence assumption and then try to see how far can we push the mathematical results so that the methodologies can be developed for this sort of dependent data and then we can also provide some sort of guarantees towards this method. Now my like this sort of dependence as I mentioned could be literally I mean it, it, it dip, like when you say it's independent there is very easy notion of what exactly that means that certain units behave quote unquote independently, not going into a lot of mathematical definition here. But the other part, like when you say, okay, it actually is not independent, is what kind of becomes difficult to characterize. Now, as I mentioned, mostly I work on time series, which means that it's like a time dependent. You observe certain units over time, and then you try to do something. You try to say forecast what it's going to be in the future or you try to understand the past trend. Or it could be, let's say, spatial dependence. It could be like a network dependence, like there's a certain network, could be social network or other networks. And then you try to see how they evolve over time or like how the communities are connected. So I think uh, it has various applications like in, in biomedical field, in different forms of engineering. And of course, like one of my own research trust is in like a lot of applications in forecasting, which is towards the economics and econometrics direction. So this sort of exploring dependence can be shown to have many interesting applications in these fields at least. And with this, I also have an additional question that uh, if you could also simply explain that how time series and time varying models work in real world scenarios. So time series is more like an umbrella term, which is, as I mentioned in my last answer, it's uh, any series that's observed over time, if I put it that simply. So you might be looking at, say, st certain stock price, or you might be looking at, let's say, some sort of production data, or maybe like like the temperature data, rainfall data, et cetera, et cetera. Anything observed over time is a time series data. Uh, it does not necessarily have to be one unit. You could observe like an entire vector or entire spatial region or what, et cetera, et cetera. Now, time varying model is a more specific term in the sense that we all know what regression means. Like in regression, you regress a certain predictor on uh, a certain, like, sorry, a certain response on a certain predictor. Now, uh, when we do this regression, we assume that like there is a fixed effect Typically, there is a fixed effect 
and uh, this effect kind of signifies the importance of this particular predictor. Now, a time varying model would say, hey, you know what, like this uh, response file, response values, they are probably not just uh, like stationary in the sense that they might actually vary over time. And so you should probably also allow flexibility in those coefficients and then maybe also let them vary over time. Now, what that does is that like you can flexibly model these coefficients to allow for some sort of time variation. And you can probably say, okay, hey, you know, this, this particular predictor, the impact of it is increasing over time or decreasing over time. Then you go back and try to identify what are probably the external reasons that could uh, kind of enhance or decrease like the importance of this particular predictor uh, in changing the values of this response. So that's like time varying model in a sort of very brief description. It's, it's a model where you allow the coefficients to vary over time. And this is more practical whenever you look at kind of a time series data for a long horizon, long horizon of time. Okay, thank you for providing such an insightful information. So as a referee for leading journals in statistics and econometrics, how do you approach these responsibilities and uh, what do you find most rewarding about them? I think, thank you. That's a very, um, I think, important question. And we tend to not look at this a lot, but it does take a significant time. And it's also an important part of an academic career because as you know, these days getting anything published has to go through peer review. And like when it comes to peer review, we all depend on good quality peer review and timely peer review, meaning that uh, if you submit a paper, you expect to hear from these journals like in a reasonable amount of time. Now, this means that the reviewers have a very important job to do they have to do a quality job and at the same time have to maintain a certain punctuality so that the paper does not like does not just keep sitting forever now i have been uh, doing review like i've been like the referee for many different journal article over the past few years and i think it's an important part in the sense that uh, it it allows us to learn about some of the topics that we have some ideas already but at the same time a paper in a good journal only gets published if it has enough novel ideas so i think i see that as an opportunity to learn what my peers are doing and what are the new things that they are coming up with and as a referee we kind of also get a chance to exhibit our expertise now, all this takes a lot of time. These days, the like statistics journals, the lead uh, statistics journals have very large papers, like 100 pages is actually not that long for us. So you could imagine as a reviewer, if you have to learn that, it becomes a very tedious job. But at the same time, you get to learn those techniques, maybe learn some proof ideas, learn some methods and learn, learn how they are doing. So I think at the end, academically speaking, it is indeed a rewarding job. Now, uh, for me, I think I have uh, been pretty diverse in also reviewing some journals from econometrics. Those are more towards the applied side, but at the same time, you need to know the economic story of it. So it has given me kind of an exposure to learn various different topics. And I could also see what methods they could come up with. For me, it has helped me in my research because when I am writing another grant or I am like proposing a project to a student, I kind of get a sense of where the community is heading and, and, and that kind of shifts my thoughts in how I will design those projects or what sort of things I'll pitch when I write those grants. I think that's probably the most rewarding part about being referee for this leading journal. At the same time, like uh, if you are uh, doing this referee job for a while, and if you are maintaining a strong, consistent publication record, 
then you can also get appointed as like an associate editor uh, in the various journals. So that also gives you some more insights or like about how, how this publication process is going on. You get to choose like someone as referring yourself and like sort of that's the next tier where you could get promoted if you keep maintaining that. Uh, one of the most important questions, which also most of the incoming assistant professor have, those who are freshers or beginners. So you are also an experienced assistant professor. So you likely have both research and teaching responsibilities. So how do you manage to, to strike a balance between these two aspects of your academic career? Yeah, I think that's a very important, very, very important question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, it's actually my answer is going to be an uh, also an interesting one in the sense that uh, for me, I think I probably spend more time uh, towards research and like it kind of depends how you want to divide your time. There is certain amount of autonomy that's given to you when you join an university here. Of course, there are quite a bit of teaching expectations that you have to consistently bring good reviews from the students. You have to create certain course models. You cannot just say, okay, there's no exams and that's it. You cannot do that here because this, this review process by student will probably then, uh, I mean, it, it, they can give bad reviews and that probably could be bad things when you are going up for promotion or tenure. Now, uh, now, what, how, what I do typically is that when I am teaching a class for the first time, very first time, then I uh, spend a lot of time in preparing a lot of materials, meaning that I try to uh, use like very systematic uh, canvas modules, which is like a, a course platform, like a course website. And then I try to also type up my lecture notes in a very organized way. Now, whenever I teach a course for the first time, it takes significant amount of time. But typically, at least in my university and I've known in other universities also, they keep you like they kind of want you to teach the same course at least twice or thrice. So they don't give you all new courses in a fresh year. So you always get courses that you have already taught before. So in that way, it's not a new preparation when you teach it the next time. So the amount of time I have to give towards my teaching versus towards what I do in my research always varies. But I think it's not 50-50 in my case. I mean, very modestly put, I think it's 30-70 or even like maybe a little bit more tilted towards research. And as you as you keep growing, like as you, as you keep progressing towards your career, you will probably uh, understand the balance better. So I, I would say if you are... Uh, joining as an assistant professor or maybe lecturer at uh, at UK, which is the equivalent of assistant professor. So you will probably find a way, you will probably strike your own balance. You can focus on your research, but keep it in mind that like if you are a horrible teacher, it would be uh, some bad news, might, might be bad news later. So as long as you put some importance towards both of this, you should be fine. That's 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 what I think I kept in my mind that like, okay, I have to be serious enough about my teaching and of course very serious about my research. Thank you for sharing your valuable experience. So can you share some of the most notable or exciting projects you have worked on or you are currently working on in recent years? And with this, I also have one additional question that could you please also share that if you have any project vacancies in your group, maybe near future or maybe currently? Right. Uh, thank you. So I think um, it's difficult to probably point out one most notable thing that uh, I mean I have experienced in these past few years. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I always wanted to uh, venture out in different directions to learn new areas in maybe diverse related fields, and it's kind of also important towards my career that like I kind of be, I, I I kind of come out of the shadow of what my I was doing with my. PhD advisor and like build, show my certain independence from, uh, from what I was doing. And then I can, that, that would exhibit that I can lead these projects uh, independently. Now, 
one of the interesting thing is that uh, I got a ping from one of my now collaborators to work on a certain project on heavy tail and then successfully we could turn it into like four papers in a deep neural network. Now, as a PhD student, I've never worked on these areas, but these areas are becoming increasingly popular in statistics as well, as you probably know with this recent boom with AI and everything. Similarly, there was a friend uh, with whom we went to the same school back in ISI, but at that after that, she ventured more in towards the direction of probability. So when she, uh, we, we started working together on some network problems, and very recently we got some papers out in more towards like the probability direction. So I think these are some of the most exciting, uh, exciting things about what I feel like I have probably achieved over the last few years. I am bad at saying no. I think saying no is a good practice. But at the same time, I took them as challenges and then like also learned new stuff and then was able to get something going on, get something productive out of it. About the vacancy, I think uh, I do have like a, a current NSF funding going on, which has some vacancy for student uh, appointment. But at the same time, how these funds are managed by the university, you probably need to be like a student at University of Florida first for me to actually allow you to come to this group. I know that's a bit of a restriction. I am pretty much open to work with uh, someone unofficially over maybe zoom meeting or even like maybe meeting if i am visiting or they are visiting but of course i mean there are opportunities to get like more relaxed unrestricted funds if that happens i will definitely update it in my web page and you will probably get to know if there are certain vacancies open up we do get i mean by we i mean me and my other colleagues we do get quite a bit of emails like about like hello can you appoint us but i i always reply to that is that if you want to be appointed as kind of in the more official way uh, the only way i can appoint is through university of florida where i am an assistant prof there you can apply once you come in then we can definitely start working together but if not even then as i mentioned that i have worked with various sorts of collaborator over field personnel and like meeting, like web meetings. So that avenue always remains open to if you are wanting to work with me. So in your opinion, what are the emerging trends or challenges in the field of statistics and data analysis? And how do you see this field progressing in the near future? So that's a very good question and also a pretty difficult one to answer. The reason I say this is that, and it's, it's kind of, an irony that I'm saying that uh, predicting where the field would go is difficult given like, you know, as statistician, especially someone who has worked on time series and forecasting, uh, forecasting remains like predictions I, should be easy, right? But it's actually not the case when it comes to like where an academic field would go. It's a very diverse field to begin with. Like a statistics as a field itself is, uh, has extreme uh, opportunities to be very interdisciplinary, meaning it can have applications towards like the biostatistics, the bio applications. It can have applications as economics, as some of those I have explored myself. It can be very, uh, uh, it can be very, uh, what should I say? It can be very mathy, mathematical, and it can also have a very interesting focus on machine learning. If I were to predict, I mean, based on what I have been seeing, how the uh, papers are coming out in these top journals in statistics. I think the next big trend is going to prove statistical results for uh, neural networks and related machine learning topics. That is something I think every statistician is trying to jump on. I mean, with the recent boom of, you know, chat GPT and the other LLM, NLP could also be another thing where statisticians might actually spend some time but i if you are ask me to pinpoint one direction that you th i think uh, people will flock on more is probably the area of neural network is what i think uh, it it has been very popular to computer scientists and like maybe machine learning scientists if there is a term like that 
But now more mainstream statisticians are jumping onto it to explore statistical property. Now, you might ask me like, okay, what's exactly the difference between these? I do see machine learning as a statistical method. You propose a methodological, I mean, you propose sort of an algorithm, you propose a method, but after you propose a method, you can propose any method in the world. It doesn't matter. But unless you prove that your method is good, then, then only it gets some credibility. Now, this proof part is where we come in as statistician who can actually uh, establish, okay, that there are certain good properties of these methods that can ensure that it would function in a diverse range of scenario. Now, that's, that's what, I mean, I feel like people are gearing more towards uh, exploring neural networks and maybe these sort of large models and then try to build some statistical properties in the next few years. But we never know. Statistics have gone through various different stages. Around 80s, it was all like bootstrap, resampling type of stuff. After that came lasso, high dimensional. And then now again, the shift is going towards neural networks. Probably the next few years would be people will be focusing on neural networks quite a bit as we have seen empirically, they are doing pretty good. After that, we will, it, it, it remains to be seen what can happen. Thanks, Shayar, for sharing such an insightful uh, experience and such a nice discussion. So we are on the verge of ending of our session. But before that, I usually ask to all of my guests that uh, what uh, advice, what piece of important advice would you give to students or any early career researchers who are interested in pursuing a career in statistics and conducting and want to conduct research in data analysis. Yeah, thank you, Ayan. I think it has been a very good experience for me as well personally to share some of my own experience, some of how, how things have panned out recently. And I don't think I am in a place to give advice yet. Like to, But, but since you asked, I'll try myself. Uh, whatever I feel like could probably help. Now, uh, I probably should put like a little bit of a distinction between a career in statistics and just conducting research in data analysis. And also, it's a kind of a misconception that as a statistician, all we do is data analysis. That is not true. I think statisticians are mostly believed to be someone who are uh, not only will propose new methods and also will propose like some, uh, they will be able to solve complex problems. And at the same time, whatever methods that they propose, they'll be able to prove that these methods would work in, in like in certain scenarios, at least it, which would solve this particular in the context of the problem. So if you are willing to, uh, pursue a career in statistics, uh, there are actually, truly speaking, many different avenues you could go to. It could be very mathematical. It could be very applied. It could be very methodological as well. I think what is important for you to figure out is to figure out in which direction you might go. But before you do that, you have to get like certain amount of training even to be able to get to that answer. When you are pursuing a career in statistics, no matter what you do after it, maybe say your bachelor's or master's, if you are enrolling into a graduate program here, at least for a year or two, you have to do the coursework. I would say take those course for very seriously because those kinds of uh, create a benchmark where from which you can get a better feeling which direction you would go to. Personally, for me, I uh, when, during my coursework period when in the beginning of my PhD, I certainly knew that I do not want to do something that is very computation heavy. So my research during at least my PhD was pretty theoretical at that time. I do not know whether that was the most wise decision or that was the best decision. I don't go back and regret it at all nowadays. But like I said, there are many other uh, different avenues. You could probably do something very applied. You could something do very methodological. All sorts of options are there. As I've already mentioned in this interview, that statistics as a subject is very interdisciplinary, which is also very stimulating for me and many others that you get to work with many different other fields of science. Uh, that you can also be ex that that you can also be excited about. 
I think you need to do build up a strong technical background. You need to be good in writing codes. You need to be good in like proving some theorems, some results, and you need to start thinking, start reading more, and then maybe solve complex problems. What is a complex problem is also an important question. What is a problem worth solving? And that only you can build a notion after you read or like get accustomed to what the community is doing. So my best wishes for you and hopefully if you need any sort of guidance or any sort of feedback, I am always available to, uh, to, to, to do. I mean, you can always write to me and I can always try to give you some form of guidance, some form of help. Uh, that was, that was, that was, that's all. I think, I think it was a very enriching experience for me to be able to talk and share some of my ideas, some of my uh, experience in this short and brief interview with Dr. Chakri. Okay. Thank you uh, for your time. And uh, we wish you all the best for your future interviews. Thank you. Thank you.